final keynote, Twyla, uh, has done a bit of everything in our space, which is why I think she's going to make a big impact on all of us here. Uh, she has was the founder of a CFO and advisory firm, much like Acuity is up in Canada, called 2080. She was a founder just like us. She's worked with clients, had to deal with some of the same joys and challenges. I think those will be talked about today. She also founded a startup technology company, Helm. Many of us have used that, cash flow forecasting. So she's done a tech startup. And now she is at FreshBooks, which is the second largest, is that right, in North America? You know, accounting, accounting system. I was up with her last week. Um, so she's seen it all. Everything from the large, large side to starting her own firm like us to actually starting a startup. So she's done it all. But the thing I'll say that you need to know most about Twyla is as, as impressive as her background is, there is not a single person I know who is a bigger advocate for accountants today in North America. She is done so much to advocate for our profession, specifically I will say women in the profession, is what she's really well known for. And it is just a huge, huge honor to have our friend Twyla here. She's my dear, dear friend. Thank you, Twyla. Y'all are gonna love this part. Come on, Twyla. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Oh, what an intro, oh my goodness. Wow. All right, I'm just gonna just adjust things here just a little bit. All right, Acuity team, I'm so pumped to be here. This is my first time outside of the Atlanta airport. I've been in the airport, <laughs> made some connections. It's my first time actually, they actually let me out of the airport this time. So I'm really excited to be here today and really honored to, to spend time with you and to meet all of you. Let's get started by asking the executive team to join me in these hot seats right here up on the stage. Depends if you want to talk, but uh, I, 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 you don't really need a microphone. No, you're good. You're good. Yeah. Okay. I'll try not to cover up their pretty faces, uh, but I, I want to give you all something. Okay. One for you and you, Lisa, Scott, Matthew. Patty, this is something that I'm, I'm happy to give you. What is it? A pencil. It's a pencil. It's an unsharpened pencil. It's an unsharpened <laughs> pencil, you're right. It is a high quality brand pencil. Ah, well, there's, fair, there's that. Uh, this, if you remember, when we spoke yesterday, I spoke to each of these folks yesterday, and I told them I was going to give them a writing utensil. Didn't I tell you all that yesterday? So here it is. Here's the writing utensil I told you I'd give you yesterday. I gave it to you today. It works, oh, if you have a sharpener. <laughs> uh, no paper. I didn't wrap it, but it's the pencil. It's the pencil I told them I was gonna give them. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, I give one thank you, but I don't know. I feel like they're a little underwhelmed. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, let's try this again. Kelly, if you could help me with these gifts right here, let's try this again and see if I do any better. This time, this gift is at least wrapped. In fact, it's wrapped in my favorite color bag. I actually think the tissue paper matches the color of my eyes. I am so excited about this gift. This is something special. You can go ahead and open it. Oh my goodness. What is in here? Ketchup chips. So in Canada, we have ketchup chips. They are my absolute, <laughs> the other Canadian in the room was relay. Do you like ketchup chips, Yusuf? <laughs> uh, the ketchup chips are my absolute favorite treat. But the other thing that's in here is a writing utensil. Here we go. The writing utensil. I told them I would give them yesterday. This time, the, the writing utensil is my favorite everyday pen. My favorite everyday pen. And then, what else is in there? Oh, no, it took me that long to get to the pencil. Get to the pencil. I did wrap these pretty well. I mean, these are exciting gifts. There's a book. 
Y'all, I am so excited to read this book. This book, if you don't know, has just come out in the theaters, and it's a movie now. I have not read the book, so I, I am pumped to read this book. I'm going to read this book, and then I'm going to go to the movie. This is such a special gift, a special gift maybe kind of tailored for me, but uh, it's, it's a special gift, and at least I didn't give you a pair of shoes that I love in my size. I gave you something that's useful. You all can read. You can write. If you don't like the ketchup chips, I'll take them back. Like, this is, this is an exciting <laughs> gift. <laughs> give them to me. I'll take them. Yeah, I'll take Give them to Kenji. He likes them. Uh, this is a gift kind of tailored for me, but I was really excited to give it to you all. Hmm. All right. Well, it's but thank you, yeah, all right, all right. Uh, it's better than an unsharpened pencil, but perhaps you're not going to rush home and tell your family about this amazing gift Twyla gave you. Uh, one more time. I'm going to try this one more time and see if I can nail this. Let's see. This time, this time, the tissue is their favorite color, not my favorite color. This time... The bag has a card. You can go ahead and open the card. It's to me instead of Twilight crossed out. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wanted the ketchup chips. Handwritten it's a handwritten note. Individual handwritten note. I think I'm going to make Kenji cry over there. All right, all right. Revenge is a beast, Kenji. Um, <laughs> all right, keep opening. Rip those things open. I'm hoping that you're excited about this gift because the other gift is a little underwhelming. The book is, uh, yeah, where the crawdads sing. Have you read it? Ah, I've heard it's a good book. I can't wait to read it. So this time, it's a gift that's a little more tailored to them. You did, you did. I, I, hear I'm, I feel like I'm covering you up, Patty. I'll move to this side and cover up Kenji. <laughs> so this time, they still got the writing utensil. Oh, my goodness. Something for Ruthie. My dog, Ruthie. This time, the gifts still have a writing utensil in their favorite color. Finally, I gave them some paper. Dear God. Finally, they got some paper. Oh, my gosh. What did Matthew get? It's to collect the eggs. Maybe now it matches the color of his eyes. I don't know. Like, what do y'all think? So this time, each gift was tailored to them. Each gift is individual, a handwritten note. An individual gift, the writing utensil, finally some paper. I gave each of them a journal, for God's sakes. Finally, they can use that utensil. What do you all think? Is this a better gift? It's a great gift. No. <laughs> all right. So finally, I could say I nailed it. I nailed it. Still, if you don't like the ketchup chips, you can give them back. But I nailed it with the third gift, finally. All right. Enjoy your gifts, friends. You can go ahead and take a seat. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Look at that apron. I am loving that. <laughs> yes! Yes! Now I nailed that one for sure. I actually, I actually won't take these home, y'all. If, if anyone's dying to try ketchup chips, I'll throw them, but they'll turn into cornflakes. So. <laughs> uh, I love the honesty of not lo loving ketchup chips. All right. Is this my clicker here? I've been so excited about these gifts. Okay. Cool. All right. Ooh, it works. Okay, um, by chance, can we get this TV on? Is that a big ask? Um, no rush, and if it doesn't work, it's fine. Um, all right, let's recap that gifting experience. So the first gift, of course, the first gift was the pencil, and the first gift was very plain, but it was exactly what I told them I would give them. Yesterday, I said, I'm going to give you a pencil, and then today, I gave them a pencil, it wasn't wrapped, it wasn't sharpened, I didn't give them any paper, but it was exactly what I told them I would give them. The next gift, well, this was the gift that was practically a pair of shoes that I love 
in my size addressed to me. Not quite, but almost. It may as well have been something that wasn't useful to them at all. It was really the perfect gift for me. Thank you. Something that I wanted to receive. I was willing to take back those ketchup chips. Like This was something that I really wanted. The next gift, this was the gift that was for them. This was the gift that really was something that I put some thought into. I wrote them each a handwritten note. I wrapped it with the tissue. Jeez, you all kind of made a mess up here. Uh, uh, with the tissue <laughs> that uh, was your favorite color, the writing utensil still that was now in their favorite color pen, as well as finally some paper. And I, I think that that gift was pretty special and that I really personalized it for them. So tell me, of the three gifts, the pencil, the gift just for Twyla, or the third gift tailored for them, which gift made a lasting impression? Which gift was the one that was memorable, surprised them? Which gift would they actually, I hope, will go home tonight and say, you, can't, you won't believe this gift that I got today? Gift one, show me by show of hands, or just yell it out if you're at home, or virtually type it into the chat. One, two, or three? Three. Three. Of course it's gift three. The gift three was the gift that I put some thought into. It was the one that I curated just for them. And as the giver of the gift, it was actually underwhelming for me to give the gift that was just for me. I thought it would be kind of fun, but it wasn't really that exciting. It wasn't as fulfilling as I thought it would be. As a giver, I want to give a gift that they really want, that makes them feel special, makes them feel heard, makes them feel like I truly care about them. And of course, as the receiver, I mean, Matthew's still wearing his apron. He wants to, they want to get, receive a gift that feels like it's just for them too. The receiver, when you get a gift, if you know that there's not really been much thought into it, in fact, if you're partner has ever done this. Uh, they don't put much thought into it. You're kind of like, eh, all right, uh, thanks. Kind of like <laughs> they were saying thanks, uh, but they didn't really enjoy the gift and they won't really enjoy a gift that's not really tailored for them. And your clients, your clients are exactly the same. They want to feel like you've heard them. They want to feel like you've actually listened and that you care about them and that you want, they want to work with you and, and get to know you better because you want to get to know them better. All right, so tangible gifts like we gave today, quality time, acts of service, words of affirmation. If you're familiar with the love languages, there's business appreciation languages that are the same as those love languages, minus the uh, physical touch. I won't be held responsible for anything y'all do that's that love language. But the business appreciation languages are the same for, <laughs> for uh, as the love languages. So some people do appreciate gifts. Some people actually want quality time with you as their professional. Some will want... Uh, for you to give them words of affirmation. It's hard to be a business owner. It's scary. And they want you to tell them when you're do they're doing a good job. Or in some cases, they want you to do something for them. Help me out with something. I need something from you. All right. So rather than gifts, gifts, let's think of them as gives. Let's think about what we can give to our clients to have them feeling really special, to have them feeling really heard, really seen, and like you truly care about them. All right, so you might be thinking, you're asking me to do something that personal for my client. How the heck do I know what they want? How do I know what's going to matter to them and what they'll really value? Well, how did I know what the acuity team, exec team wanted? How did I know that Matthew wouldn't take off that apron? How did I know what they really wanted? I asked them. I asked them some basic questions that then provided me with their answers that then I had lots of ideas. Trust me when I say, if I could easily get more things from Canada down to Atlanta, there was far more things I could have bought them. I had lots of ideas with just a few simple questions that I asked them. 
So how do we know what the clients want? Similarly, we ask them. The first thing that we want to do is we want to gather information, but it's not quite that simple. You actually have to create a really safe space and a really inviting relationship that's going to prompt them to share and have them feeling comfortable to tell you what you need to know. The second thing is that you need to curate your gifts. You need to actually base your decision of what you're going to provide to them off of what you learned inside of gathering the information. And then the third thing is you have to keep giving. You have to keep giving them things. Now, you don't have to give them something every time, but you certainly can't say, I'll do something once and think that you're done. So let's dive into each of these. But first, I want to share with you something. And, and I know Anu yesterday was talking a lot about the subconscious mind. And there's a professor at Harvard that said that 95% of our purchasing decisions take place in the subconscious mind. So this means that whether you're just starting out with a brand new client or you're working with a client who's on a recurring monthly engagement, the first time or that recurring time that they're working with you or purchasing from you, they're subconsciously deciding whether or not they want to continue or start to work with you, which means your gives are all laddering up to that subconscious decision, which means your gives need to be tailored to them and actually speak to their business appreciation language. So let's go into step one. In step one, this is where you're creating the relationship that gets them feeling comfortable enough to share, comfortable enough to open up to you. <clears throat> and since client relationships are human relationships, this starts with how you show up. <laughs> Maybe next time, the apron needs to be the green. I know you like green, the green dress. <laughs> There's an art though, to knowing how to show up. There's value in understanding how to show up for your clients and knowing what they need from you. So do they need that buttoned up professional or do they actually need a casual business expert? Do they need something tangible? Maybe it's a report to take to the bank or their investors, or do they need you to listen to their ideas and bounce some things around with? Knowing how, what they want from you and what, what you can, how you can show up allows them to appreciate what it is that you're going give to give to them. You all know how to do this in personal relationships. We do this all the time with our spouse or our partner or our family, our friends. We show up for them the way that they need us to show up for them. So similar, your clients appreciate the same. So if you don't know your clients, as well as you know your friends and family member, this is where you need to start asking. You need to start asking some thoughtful questions, and you need to dig into what it is that they, they really need from you. Maybe you need to start with learning more about their industry, as some of you were doing yesterday, which was really exciting. Maybe you need to learn more about their customers, because that's really what's on their mind. If you don't do this, if you don't dig into what it is that they want, essentially, when you give them something, you will give them the shoes that you love in your size. All right, so it's time that you got to ask some meaningful questions and ask some really thoughtful questions in order to dig into what it is that they really need. And in order to do that, you have to create a safe space. You have to have a space that has them feeling open and comfortable enough to share. And in doing so, you need to be extremely thoughtful with the questions that you ask them. All right, I heard some chuckling already. If this is the image that you think of when I say, create a safe space where they're going to feel comfortable enough to share, I get it, I get it. And then if you're thinking, wait a sec, I'm an introvert. Hold up, where are introverts at? Actually, wait, 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 no, no, no. Introverts don't want to raise your hand. Where are the extroverts at? All right. We're on team introvert here. I can see it. Because if this makes you feel uncomfortable, I get it. When I used to work with clients in our firm, this was often me. This was often me hoping they canceled the client meeting. 
Has this happened to anyone? Sometimes you just don't feel like peopling, let alone laying down on a couch and getting comfortable. <clears throat> Even though my team had invested time into creating the deliverables that we were going to talk about in that client meeting, and then I had spent time, because I like to be prepared, I, I spent time digging into those financials and really analyzing them, and I was ready to go for that meeting. I was 100% okay if they wasted my team's time and my team and canceled today. <laughs> but they never did. <laughs> they always showed up. And when they showed up and I could get really personal with them and we could dive into some of the things that really mattered to them and I could create a safe space where they could share more with me and we could really humanize our relationship, I was actually reminded of why I started on this path to begin with and why I loved helping business owners. And what you may not realize, you may not realize, that professional expertise you have, it's actually really intimidating. One day in our firm, when I had one of those client meetings, they didn't cancel. I was talking with my client, and this was further along in our relationship, and we had got to know one another better. And she finally opened up to me, and she said, before we got to this spot, and it felt like we really connected, I found you really intimidating. What? I'm five foot three. This is likely the loudest I've talked in months. How could I be intimidating? But when we push ourselves inside that professional mold of how we think we should show up, it can actually be really intimidating. It can actually be really uncomfortable for the clients, which is why it's so important that we create that safe space where they're able to share while we can still showcase our professional expertise. So set yourself up for success. And this might look like, if you're that introvert, it might look like knowing yourself better. It might look like knowing I'm better in the morning. <laughs> or it might be, I'm best when I've had two hours of planning and prep work with those deliverables before I meet the client. Or I like to send it to them in advance and send them all the questions so that they know what's coming and that we stay with what it is that we're going to talk about. Or heck, this can go so far as realizing that there's a particular jacket where you feel most confident wearing that jacket put on that jacket. I actually have a denim jacket. Kenji's probably, did I wear that in drink? I don't know. I probably, I actually, I did. It's my favorite denim jacket. I wore that to a board meeting for fresh books, if you can believe it. Um, so it's my favorite denim jacket. And I wear that because I feel really good in that jacket. I feel like I can be myself and I feel like I can show up the way I want to show up in that jacket. So simple things that we can do to set ourselves up for success. If you're still not sure where to start, or you don't have a denim jacket, I'll get you all a denim jacket if that's what it is. Um, but if, if you're not sure where to start, I'm going to share with you something that I call my question methodology. Now, this question, question methodology used to have three questions. I used to call it the why, what, where. About six months ago, I shared that methodology and these questions with a respected thought leader in our profession, Jeannie Whitehouse. And she told me a question that she likes to ask her clients. So I've added that to the question methodology now. So now I call it the why, what, where squared. And these questions that I'm going to give you in a moment are questions that no matter where you're at in your client relationship, you can pause and ask these questions. All right. The first question, why did you start this business? The second question, what keeps you up at night? I heard that on the panel yesterday. What's the stressor? What keeps you up at night? The third is where do you want your business to be in five years time? And the fourth question, this is the question that Jeannie added, is where do you go to find out how your business is doing? So the answers to these questions will tell you what matters to them. It will tell you why do they love what they do? What gets them out of bed in the morning? It'll tell you 
What's that stressor? We know business owners have stressors. What's the stressor right now that's bothering them that perhaps you could provide some insights into or alleviate some of that stress for them? The third one then is about their business and you can get to know what is it that matters? Are they looking to sell or be acquired? Are they going to have a thriving business that they can pass down to their children? And then the last one is where do they go to find out that health? And that means what do they use as a barometer or an indicator to tell them how they're doing in their business? For some folks, you probably know this, some people, it's their bank account balance, right or wrong. It's their bank account balance. For some, it's I'm finally able to pay myself a, an appropriate wage. And in other cases, it might be, no, I look at the last quarter's new signups, and that's how I tell how I'm doing. So ask these questions, and you're going to be able to find out what truly matters to them. And you'll be able to go a few layers deeper to actually get to a give that will matter for them. All right, so I'm just going to give you a moment, a brief moment, to just think of a client or two clients, even three if you've got them. Who's a client that you think, huh, I don't know some of the answers to these questions, or I've never really asked this, or the common one, I think I know, but do I know? Have I asked those questions? So think of that one or two client, those one or two clients that you're going to percolate on and think about how am I going to weave this into the conversation to just get to know them a little bit better. All right, now that we're creating a safe and comfortable space for you and your clients, and we are getting some insights and some quality information that will help us give something really special to them or something that they value, now we get to the fun part. This is the part where we actually get to talk about how we're going to curate something that's going to matter and something that's even surprising and exceptional. First of all, think about why did the client hire you? Why did they hire you? Often with accounting services, unfortunately, our clients don't hire us because they want to. They hire us because they need to. And so as a result, you're in a different position where you're trying to actually get them to a spot of wanting to work with you instead of needing to work with you. So if you think about what it is that they hired you to do, what they need, they probably need a tax return, financial statements, something to raise a round of investment, their bookkeeping caught up. They need something from you. And that's what they hired you to do and that's what they expect you to do. Very similar to the pencil I gave to the exec team. I told them I would give it to them, and then I gave it to them. So if you think of the, the idea of why do your clients work with you and hire you versus how, do they, how you get them to the spot of they want to work with you, then I challenge you to think about what's the icing on the cake? What's the cherry on top? What I do know for sure is that they do not hire you so that you'll speak accounting jargon, even though we all love to talk accounting jargon. They don't hire you for accounting jargon. They also don't hire you to talk over their head and kind of speak in gibberish, almost like the Charlie Brown teacher. They definitely don't hire you so you'll give them report after report after report that they're like, I have no idea what these mean, but I don't want to ask them. They don't hire you for any of those reasons, so they definitely don't keep you for any of those reasons. Instead, they stay with you because you meet them where they're at and because you want to be helpful and you're providing valuable insights, not insights that really don't matter to them or they don't understand. And of course, they still hire you to prepare and submit the deliverables. So they'll stay with you if you become that professional they want rather than just the professional they need. So very similar to a friend or a furry family member, you could do life without them, but it's better to do life with them. So this is absolutely possible in every line of business. Accounting work, all lines of business, I believe you can create an experience that has people thinking, 
I don't want to live without that. I want to do that again. In fact, last night, uh, I'm not seeing them now, but we were talking about, it was you, uh, Tamara, we were talking about the, the cruise, and, and you were t- talking about how once you get to, uh, to have some of those experiences when you travel, you're like, I don't want to go back to the Super 8. I want to go to the, the nice place. <clears throat> this is a record player. Ah, I see you in the back now. <laughs> it was you and your husband that were having this debate. Uh, this is a record player, a simple record player. This record player was in one of my hotel rooms. I know I might be fooling you, but I grew up in the 80s. Of course, I'm joking. Of course, I grew up in the 80s. Uh, <laughs> uh, but a record player is very nostalgic to me. We had a record player in our family home. I would listen to records. I would sing along with the records. This is something that feels really familiar to me. It feels really comfortable. A record player to me feels safe. It feels like home. So these are all feelings that any hotel room would want their guests feeling. Of course, they want their guests to feel safe and feel comfortable and feel welcome there. And subconsciously, now, when I'm looking to book a hotel room in that city again, I'm drawn to those feelings I had with that hotel room that felt so comfortable. This is a movie theater. Do you all remember your first time going to a movie? Movie theaters have historically been rows upon rows that are way too close together and certainly not designed for someone who's five foot three to watch a movie in front of somebody who's six feet tall. The popcorn was over-salted popcorn. You had some candy that your dentist really didn't want you eating. And then you had soda pop. Do y'all call it pop or soda pop here? Coke. You had Coke. All right. You had Coke. (laughs) Uh, You had Coke that came from the fountain that when you taste it, you're like, is this Coke? I'm not even sure this is Coke. Although the movie quality, so the sound and the video of movies has, has definitely changed over the years, the actual movie theater experience really hasn't changed that much in decades until now. Have you all been to a VIP movie experience? Even better yet, an adults-only VIP movie experience. Not the same as an adults-only movie, just to clarify. <laughs> it's not between the physical touch and the movie. Jeez, I'm, I won't be invited back to CutieCon, that's for sure. Um, somebody sign up your liability, like, do that now. Uh, <laughs> uh, the VIP adults-only movie experience has got seating that's spread way further apart. And it's got leather seats that recline. In, in Canada, they're heated. I maybe here they're air-conditioned? I don't know. In Canada, they're heated. You could still get the salted popcorn and the Coke uh, and the sticky candy, but you can also get full meals with dessert. And you can get drinks with alcohol in them. It's quite the experience. You can finally relax and settle in. And the movie itself is very similar to the movie with the tight rows together. But the experience of sitting in those chairs and relaxing and getting really comfy, having a drink or two, a movie theater experience has really become exceptional. And this, this is La Labo. If you're not familiar with La Labo, it started in 2006 in New York City and now has locations all across the U.S. It's a perfumery. And even though it's only 16 years old, the business is 16 years old, you can see from the picture, it's quite, I like to call it old-timey. It's old-timey feeling with the decor and the lighting and the, the, uh, the walls and the fixtures. And this counter that you see in the middle, that's where they have their 20 different fragrances, and you walk up to that counter, and somebody comes and they help you check out the scents. So you can smell them, you can try them on. If you're like me, you can come back the next day and smell them again and try them on again. And I'm not somebody 
who has enjoyed perfume. I, I'm not a perfume person, but this, this store drew me in. I was really comfortable in there. I was having so much fun trying out these different scents that I didn't just smell them and try them on. I bought one. I spent more money on perfume. Don't tell my husband. I spent more, I'm not joking. He was actually there patiently sitting on the sidelines going, dear God, how long is this going to take? But I spent more money on a bottle of perfume than I ever thought I would ever spend on a bottle of perfume. And the cool thing is, is when you pick out your bottle of perfume, there's that spot in the back there on the, the left. That's a laboratory. They make your perfume right in front of you. It's like a science experiment. It's really fun. And then the label, so the bottom right-hand corner, that's a picture of the bottle of perfume that I bought. It's a custom label. It has the date, the location that I bought it at, and my name on it. So now every time I see this pretty bottle in my bathroom, I'm taken back to that experience when they were so patient with me coming there and coming back again and trying them on again. And it felt, I'm, I'm reminded of that really personalized custom experience of how it felt to be in that store and to try on that perfume. So all three of these experiences were positive experiences for me. All three of them, I gave them my money in all three cases, but it was an elevated experience that I received, and it was something that I wasn't, wasn't expecting, or it was something that felt really comfortable or felt really specialized to me. Science has told us, I mean, this isn't actually a surprise. Science has told us that we actually have dopamine that occurs that when we feel good, when we have pleasurable events. But did you know that it actually has a positive impact on the giver as well. Gift-giving behavior causes humans to release feel-good chemicals in the brain. So serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, which actually creates this warm glow effect. This behavior releases endorphins, which produce positive, a positive feeling known as the helper's high. So it's a great experience for the person who's receiving the gift, but it's actually also a really great experience for the person who's giving the gift. All right, I'm gonna pause here for a moment. Now that I shared three of my experiences with you, I want you to just think for a moment of a time when you had an elevated experience. I think you have one probably already with the cruise where you had a really great experience and you felt what it felt like to either have something you didn't expect or something that had you feeling really comfortable or really surprised and delighted you. And as you think of that experience, I want you to think of how will I take this into the accounting space and replicate it? How will I give somebody out something that has them feeling really special or feeling like they've got a hit of dopamine from you as their accounting professional? All right. Now that you're feeling all the feels and thinking about some good experiences, and I shared some of my really great experiences with you, I want to tell you something. I have to tell you that you don't just need to now do this. You have to do it consistently. You have to do it consistently. There is no finish line when it comes to creating an exceptional client experience. You can't do something once and then think, I'm done. I'm going to hang up my cleats. It doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tell you uh, that it's not that easy. You have to keep giving. You have to keep going. Human relationships require that consistency, just like your relationships outside of work. You have to keep investing in those relationships, and your client relationships are the same. <clears throat> If you do just one good thing, this is what will happen. It'll fade. It drifts away. They'll forget about it. And in order to really reap the benefits of giving, you have to keep doing it consistently. And some of those benefits of giving consistently include exp opportunities to expand your services with the client. It includes prevention of client churn because they love, they want to work with you. It includes marketing and that they're going to refer new clients to you. I saw yesterday some, com uh, some things from Patty and Lisa about MPS scores. It'll improve those MPS scores. 
There's numerous reasons why you want to stay consistent and keep investing in the relationship. So you need to be intentional with your gifts. You need to be consistent. You need to keep customizing those gifts. But there's good news. It gets easier. Just like a tailor who's making a custom suit, the first time is the hardest time. The first time is the most challenging. They don't have the measurements. They don't know what colors those customers like. They don't know what patterns and and types of material are going to look good on that customer. But if they invest that time up front and they really get to know what fits nicely and what colors and what fabrics, they'll be able to make a custom suit that looks like a million bucks and fits just right again and again and again. So this is why you get to know your clients better. And you keep giving to them and you keep talking to them so that you know exactly what the client finds valuable so it's easier to keep doing it and easier to keep giving. Now, I know, Team Acuity, this is not lost on all of you. I know you know how to do this already. In fact, you all surprised and delighted me about a year and a half ago. This is an episode of what? Drink while you think. This is drink while you think. I'm pretty sure right now if we played a game of caption this, that Matthew would say, this is the time we made Twyla cry. (laughs) And you'd think from the look on Kenji and Matthew's face, you'd think, there's nothing to cry about. Or they take a lot of pleasure in making a girl cry. Now, if you haven't watched this episode, this was certainly an episode that was truly a surprising and customized experience for me as the receiver. If you don't know the episode, this episode was recorded on World Autism Awareness Day. And what you all did, and Kenji and Matthew presented to me that day, was you all gave a donation to Autism Calgary. My daughter's on the autism spectrum. So we lean into Autism Calgary regularly for resources, for support, for guidance. It was definitely a give that was really special to me and something that was tailored just for me. You all probably wouldn't appreciate a donation to Autism Calgary, but I certainly did. It was very special for me to receive that, and I felt that give. It was, it's now very near and dear to my heart. So you all know how to do this already. Kenji and Matthew know how to do this. This is a gift on behalf of all of you. You know how to do this. You know how to get that receiver excited about what you give to them. Heck, make them cry for gosh sakes. You know how to give something truly special. There's one more secret. It's a secret benefit to consistently showing up for your client. Now, this is something... We don't really like to talk about, but perhaps it's happened to all of you. I'll admit it, it's happened to me, that sometimes we screw up. Sometimes we make a mistake. Maybe we miss a really important email that we really should have responded to, or we neglected to add that new employee to the client's payroll. Ugh, the worst feeling. Sometimes this happens, but when it does happen, If you've already been giving to your client and they're already feeling really valued in that relationship and they're high on dopamine because they just received something really special from you, usually, usually, they'll give you one get out of jail free card. And sometimes we need to redeem those cards. So another reason to just keep giving because it can create that space where they're going to give us a bit of grace. We don't want these things to happen but sometimes they do. We're human. It can happen. So keep listening to your client. Keep showing up for that client. Keep asking questions. Your client's going to change and evolve, and you need to change and evolve along with them. They're human. They'll change. Their business will change, which means you need to change and grow along with them, which means you have to keep asking these questions. All right, let's recap. So the first thing I mentioned was you need to gather information 
So you need to gather information that's going to be helpful for you to be able to determine what is it that matters to them. What is that business appreciation language that they have? The second one is you need to curate your gifts for them. they got to feel special. It can't be the same package that you send to everybody else, even a handwritten note on that package or something special for them. And the third is keep doing it. Keep showing up. Keep giving something to them that has them feeling really special. Surprise them. Surprise them. <laughs> Delight them. <laughs> Give them something they don't expect. <laughs> Give them something they don't expect, something that really matters to them, something that's valuable, something that will help to create that exceptional client experience that they will not want to live without. My name is Twyla. Thank you again, Team Acuity. It's been such an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your time, and thank you for letting me come to Atlanta. <laughs> that apron looks good on you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Um. A little, you, you made me come in because you said you were going to cry and I'm going to cry now. Um, um, the real reason we started AcuityCon was Kenji and I were experiencing um, our partners, our friends, and you weren't getting that opportunity um, to, to have conversations like I've had with Twyla um, and, 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 and partner interactions like we've had with Anu and, 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 and things that are out there uh, that you guys didn't have access to. So we thought we could build that experience. That was a dream year one. So I finally feel like we're starting to execute on that dream. The thing that our partners didn't get was that the people that we have were as awesome that we talked about internally, but we just knew that internally because we only experienced you all um, and they didn't. Uh, when I went around the trade show today to a last partner, they said the favorite part about being here was getting to meet the people that they hadn't gotten to meet and they did not realize how special that you guys were um, in, in your profession and the questions you ask, and the intentionality that you do with everything that you do. So hopefully, we're starting to achieve some of those things that we meant to achieve by starting AcuityCon, by bringing these wonderful people from around the, the North America to you, uh, to meet you, and by bringing you guys all in to meet them um, on both sides. So um, it's very, very exciting to look around and see lasting connections being made. We talked about it this year, Kenji and I, about what was the theme for AcuityCon. Like we should change it every year and we're like, oh, it may never change. AcuityCon likely is always going to be about forming these new and lasting connections for all of us. And it's why we continue to travel. It's why you see Kenji going to Toronto to Fresh Pack. It's why you see next week, or I think it's coming up, Gusto Next. We have four people going up to Denver uh, to, to work with Gusto Next. It's why we continue to do that. But it's why we'll continue to have AcuityCon um, to be able to bring everybody together so you guys get to make these lasting connections. I want to say thank you to all of you for, for taking your time. One thing we value here at Acuity with our flexibility is your time, okay? So to take two days out of your calendars or three days for those of you who traveled farther is a huge deal to us. And we try to take that very seriously. We try to take all of the time you spend away from your families very seriously. And we very much uh, appreciate that. And we hope that we can meet your expectations by presenting the people that we've found around North America and trying to bring them to you. Hopefully, for those of you virtually, we've tried to be more intentional about the experience for AcuityCon. Hopefully, you experienced that today with the trade show. Um, that we've been able to meet that expectation as well. 
will continue to try to uh, improve. One thing, to, seriously, Anu and at the expense of my team, we do need to thank you very much for presenting AcuityCon this year because sustainability for us and creating this experience and creating these intentional lasting relationships, we can keep elevating. The elevation you allowed us to do was around the video and the simulcasting to our virtual teams. About half of our teammates are still experiencing AcuityCon virtually and your contribution to help us kind of up our game a little bit allowed us to do the next level of experience hopefully and we'll learn from that next year and be able to continue to build on that. And the rest of you all, the tech partners that also helped contribute, that provided breakfast or lunch or coffee uh, and dinner, we really appreciate that. That all goes to our sustainability of Objective. It's all part of the B Corp thing that Kenji's working on. We give him a hard time, but it doesn't. If we ever get B Corp certification, it's not going to change what we do. It doesn't matter really. It's be a nice achievement to make. It's never going to change our character. We're going to be uh, a public serving organization. We're going to continue to do Acuity Cares clients. So, thank you. This is what I'm trying to say for coming here, spending your time away from your families, for all you, your partners, for employees, for all of our teammates. Um, thank you for doing that, and definitely thank you for our speakers for like knock, uh, like knocking us out. We're going to start. Uh, I believe there's probably already a hashtag started. A new made me do it. <laughs> uh, so there's a hashtag for that. There's going to be one for client experience. Now it's going to be Twyla made me do it. <laughs> so we have two new hashtags started at Acuity on the Slack channel. So whenever you have one of these experiences, share it on your team Slack channel so we can see what Anu made you do and what Twyla made you do uh, from, from this, because that'll be fun uh, kind of carryover for this. So we'll start those hashtags. We'll share those fun stories with them when we see them around, uh, around the, the US and uh, North America. But thank you, everybody. That's a wrap for AcuityCon.